Well, this morning we're going to be looking in the book of Colossians in chapter 1, and we're going to be focused on these verses that were just shared with us by video. And, uh, you know, as we get into that, I want to remind you a little bit about where we are. Now, you may know where you are, right? You're at Village Baptist Church this morning. You're here with this fellowship of believers, but where are you? That's another question. Where are you in your relationship with the Lord? Where are you in this walk with Christ? Where are you along the journey? Now, that's a good question. And the other thing that we need to ask is, where have I been? You know, you've been a lot of places this summer. You know, we're kind of at the wind down. The official end of summer is next weekend on uh, Labor Day weekend. And, you know, we'll have one more rush of folks in town. And, and then it's back to, you know, us uh, regular folks most of the time for a while. But, you know, where have you been? You know, some of you have been on vacation. Some of you have traveled to the great northwest and you found cool air and all those kinds of things. But it's been kind of cool here this, this summer. Maybe you went to a rainforest or you just hung out here. You know, we've had, what, nearly 40 inches of rain this summer, which is unusual. But uh, where have you been? And when you talk about where you've been, you know, like where have we been as a church? Well, in July, I felt led of the Lord to begin a series on how to have a personal revival. And we walked our way through that, and as I was winding that up, I was saying, okay, God, what's next? And, and, and it's, uh, it's been this journey about how to live, you know, uh, uh, how to live abundantly, how to live abundantly before the Lord. And over these four weeks, and this being the fourth week, we've looked at several different aspects of that. And it's all been focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ our mind, Christ our prize, Christ our strength, and today Christ our Lord. When we looked at Christ, our mind, this is what we discovered. He keeps him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. When we look to the Lord Jesus Christ, he gives us a peace that surpasses understanding, that, that lifts us up and guards our hearts and guards our souls. And then when we looked at Christ, our prize, we, we're in this race. And in this race, we, we run, uh, and we run with uh, confidence, and we, we run with a certainty after this prize, the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, our prize. And and last week, we talked about the strength for the, for the, for the life that we live, the, the strength that we need every day for the trials and the struggles as well as the, the times of victory. And that strength comes from the Lord. The Bible says, He who waits upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And we came across a special word for that word strength that was only used 124 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. It was the word who remembers it. This is a test. If you don't remember it, I'm preaching last week's and this week's. Didn't start with a C. Who said that? Coach, back. Oh, you were in Bible study Wednesday night, so you got a double dose. But that word coach, and it's an all-encompassing strength. The Lord strengthens us intellectually and physically and spiritually, and we need the strength that only God can give. And this morning, we're going to talk about Christ our Lord, because as, as, if I'm going to know the, the peace of God, if I'm going to know the strength of God, if I'm going to know Christ is my prize, I've got to arrive at the summit, which is Christ our Lord. And so when Paul writes to the Colossians, he, in, in, in verse number uh, 9, he says, And so from the day we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sin. And so when Paul is writing these words, he's writing these words for our encouragement. He's writing that we know that we've, been trans, that we've been transferred. We've been released from the domain of darkness. We've been released from those things that hold us back. We've been released from those things that steamroll over us. We've been released from those things that would keep us from being all that God has created us to be and to live out the plan that he has planned for us. We have been released from that. And we've been transferred into, not a domain, but we've been transferred into a kingdom, a kingdom 
of his beloved light, a kingdom where we can walk in him and know him and know his strength. But now when Paul was writing to the people at Colossae, he was writing to a people who had gotten a little bit messed up. I remember I had a class way back in the very first semester of, of seminary. And it was a spiritual foundations class, and we were kind of surveying through the New Testament. And my group of four or five or six of us were given the, the responsibility to come up with a skit that would portray the truth of Colossians. Now, I don't remember anything else about the skit, but this one thing I remember, it just stands out. It started off like this. Woe is me, woe is me, heresy and colossy. And here's what that heresy was. And it's the very same heresy that I see at times trickle within the church. It was the heresy of Judaism and the heresy of Gnosticism. Now, Judaism basically said this. Judaism was about the law. It was about legal things, and it was about rituals. And Gnosticism was about being, you know, having a, a deeper knowledge that either came from being, you know, highly empowered intellectually or either this spiritual thing that had been real, revealed that had nothing to do with really what the Word of God was saying. They had this deeper knowledge because they were more spiritual than everybody else. And, you know, we see legalism and ritualism and intellectualism and, and uh, spiritualism, you know, kind of play out in, in everyday life. I mean, football season's upon us, and you see legalism play out there, right? Do you? Well, there's a certain amount of following the law of the coach that says you're going to show up for practice, you're going to be conditioned, you know, you're going to be ready, you know, we're going to go out there and, and we're going to conquer, we're going to divide, we're going to do all that. And then there's the rituals, you know, there's always the pregame rituals. Pregame rituals are, you know, tailgate parties. And uh, I remember when my, my boys were playing out in, in high school, John Sealing. The, his, his son was on the team as well. John, you know, is one of our deacons. He was the one that was advertising 98 barbecue last week. And, uh, but John, at his, uh, at his tailgate, he had a tailgate party. I mean, this is high school. And, and he always had bratwurst on the grill, you know, ritual. And, and, you know, the football team goes through a certain ritual in getting ready for the game right before. There's a silence, and, and, and everybody's focused. And, and the ritual, as they run out on the field, the, choir, the crowds have done their things, and the, the football team runs through the, the banner that says, stomp them, beat them, you know, something like that. And all that ritual mixed in. And then, you know, you've got the intellectuals. The intellectuals are much too intellectual for that kind of silly stuff to, so as to waste their time watching a silly ball game that, that doesn't matter. And, and they've reached something higher, and they're just going to sit there and read books. And then you've got the spiritualist that says, I'm not into the books, and I'm not into this. I'm into sitting out here in nature and contemplating the butterfly. You see, in the, in the church, it's played out the very same way. You know, in church life, you've got these people that, that they get all wrapped up in, in rules, a certain legalism. You know, you can't do this, you got to do that, everything is confined here. Or certain ritualism, you know, you got to do it the very same way every time you come together. For example, you know, when I come to church, I expect to have a prelude, a call to worship, a prayer, three songs, an offertory, an offertory prayer, a choir special, a sermon with three points and a, and a poem, and, and be all done in the ritualistic time of 55 minutes, 59 at the most. And if you come here, you'll be disappointed. Because I don't, you know, I, I don't hold us to that. Or, you know, you get the intellectual. The intellectual says, you know, well, I've arrived at a greater knowledge than all the rest of you dummies in church every, every Sunday, and, and I know more, and I know, you know, that I'm not going to believe in God, and, and I'm not going to believe in all that kind of stuff y'all believe in. There is, a, there is a creator, but he's not concerned with the affairs of mankind. And then you've got the spiritualist, you know, and they're sitting around, and they're doing their thing, and all this kind of stuff going on, and, and they, they're just more spiritual than you are. You've been around people like that, right? Now, now, Paul is writing to, to this kind of an issue. And as he writes this kind of an issue, you know, he's talking about the legalism and the ritualism and the, and the intellectualism and the spiritualism. And he says, here's the answer. It's not summed up in any of those things. The answer is summed up in the one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he presents this in, in three areas. He says that the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is the word he uses, is preeminent. 
Now, I remember one of the very first sermons I ever preached out of seminary was on the preeminence of Christ out of Colossians chapter 1. And my older brother, who's a thinker, you know, he said, don't use that word preeminent. Most people will never get it. Well, I'm going to help you get it. Preeminent means first place. And in, in, the, in, in the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ holds first place. As a matter of fact, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, we're going to look at this verse quite a bit this morning. It says that in everything, he might be preeminent. And so, you know, if you have the wrong view of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, you, this, is, this is the foundation, you'll have the wrong view of everything else. If Jesus was just a, a great man, you'll have the wrong view of everything else. If Jesus was just a great prophet, you'll have the wrong view of everything else. If Jesus just died and, and never rose from the grave, you'll have the wrong view. If you've got the wrong view of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll have the wrong view of everything else. So it's foundational that we grab a hold of and that we get and that we understand a proper view of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul sums up his preeminence in, in, in uh, a couple of mighty declarations. He talks first about him being the center of creation. Jesus Christ is the center of creation. And in verses 15 and 17, he says, He is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. Right here, what he is saying, he's saying he's God and he's man. He's the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation, and he is before all things, and in him all things are held together. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, then, is the, internal, is the eternal image of an invisible God, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the creator, and he is the conserver of the universe. The Lord Jesus Christ put the universe together, and he conserves the universe. And the Bible says he's behind all things created, whether in heaven or on earth or visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. That's verse 16. The entire universe is held together by the Lord Jesus Christ, and the order of things is a reflection of his very thoughts. Now, when you explore the universe, this is what you find. You don't find a, a vacant universe without uh, proof of the Almighty. When I look at the pictures at the Hubble telescope, every have uh, translate uh, heard back to hear us here on Earth, and I see all those clusters of stars, and I see all those wondrous things. It makes me more convinced. When I look up in the sky and and I see the same stars night by night, it makes me more convinced. Behold, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. God's glory is declared over and over and over again in the heavenlies. Now, Big Bang theorist, you know, they're the guys that said that the universe came together simply out of a Big Bang. As a matter of fact, out of the Big Bang, Big Bang theorists, theorists hear what they call the universal hum. The universal hum, right? Anybody ever heard of the universal hum? If you go to Taos, New Mexico, it's supposed to be really loud there, this universal hum. And this universal hum is a result of the big bang. It's, it's when the big bang happened, there were sound waves, but you know, the universe is so compact and, and, and so contracted that the sound waves only expanded as the universe expanded, right? And so as the universe has been around for 600 billion, trillion, trillion years, as they say, you know, it's expanded, it's become quite, uh, quite laid out and flat. It's, it's gone from, you know, a powerful hum to, you know, a, a more low-pitched hum that most people don't pick up on and all that kind of stuff. Remember, there was a composer, I can't tell you the date that he composed. I'm sure Grace could. Ludwig von Beethoven. When did he compose? You don't remember. But Ludwig von Beethoven you know, y'all have all heard of Beethoven, right? You know, good old Ludy. You know, when he composed, he was almost deaf. And grab a hold of this. Think of his greatest works. When he was writing some of those greatest works, his city was under attack. Cannonballs and bullets hitting the city walls. 
Wouldn't it be irrational to say that his music flowed out of the chaos of bullets and cannonballs? And in the very same way, isn't it irrational to say that an ordered universe, a rational universe, a universe with physical laws would flow out of an irrational bang? And maybe, you know, if scientists were to listen a little bit closer, instead of hearing that universal, mm, they would hear the, the universal him. And instead of looking for the bang, they would hear the word that God said, and there was light, and God said, and there was earth, and God said, and there was water, and God said, there was a lesser light, and the greater lights, and the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field, and then God said as he breathed life into man, and man became a living being created in the image of Almighty God. I received a copy of an article from a former member of our, well, I guess he's an eternal member of our church. He was my friend. Um, his name was Paul Gardner. Paul was a retired Air Force general. And uh, he commanded Air Force One's um, um, squadron or wing, whichever they are at one time in his career. But uh, Paul Gardner is a neat man, and he shared with me an article from one of his Air Force and Space uh, things. And this was an article that talked about the sounds that the NASA satellites were picking up in space. And it talked about they weren't picking up the universal hum, but they were picking up words of praising, hallelujahs to God, holy, 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 over and over again. You read the article, it'll put the chill up and down your spine. It's just absolutely amazing. For your edification, I didn't do this because I've done this in the past, but you want to see more about how the world's held together, go and look up Louis Giglio and, uh, and the uh, protein laminin. He does a great video on it. It's a great illustration because laminin, the, the shape of laminin is in the shape of a cross. And in Christ, all things hold together. The most basic hold together adhesive of the entire universe universe is held together in the shape of a cross. So go and look that up. But, but what we find is Christ is the center of creation. I've got to move on. But he's also the head of the church. The Bible tells us this. He's the head of the body. He's the first man raised from the dead. And Christ has become the head of redeemed humanity. If you have been redeemed, if your heart has been changed, if you're uh, filled with the Lord Christ, if he's your Savior and your Lord, you're part of that redeemed creation. And as a part of that redeemed humanity, you are the church. You're the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has openly declared his lordship over all created beings. In a day to come, the Lord God will demonstrate that manifold wisdom and sovereignty to the entire universe, and he's going to do that through his church. The book of Ephesians in chapter 3 verses 9 through 11 tells us this, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for the ages in God, who created all things so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This is according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you realize that angels long to look into this thing that we call salvation? They long to look into this experience that God has given us through the love that he's demonstrated through his son, Christ Jesus. As a matter of fact, I don't even believe all the demons of hell, which are fallen angels, can even begin to comprehend and understand what God has done for those who he, whom he loves. How his grace has affected our hearts and affected our lives. And because he's a God of, of, of greatness and he's a God of mercy and he's a God of grace, he's a God of faithfulness, this is what the Lord Jesus Christ declares. And this is what the Father has declared to the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the head of all things, including his church. He's the head of all love. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe upon him would not perish but have everlasting life. And you know the amazing thing about John 3.16 to me is the word whosoever. Whosoever. Do you realize that as a born-again believer, you are a whosoever? You ever think about that? 
I mean, a whosoever. You were once lost in sin. You were once, you know, misguided. You were once messed up. You were once a failure. You were once, you know, double dipped in, in sin. I mean, you know, you were just covered up. You know, you were a sinner by nature. You just did it and you couldn't help yourself. And you were a sinner by choice. By j- jolly, I'm going to do it. I don't care what anybody says. I don't have to answer to anybody. But one day, God got a hold of you. I don't know when it was or where it was or the circumstances of how it came about, but that day that you were gotten a hold of, his arms of grace just wrapped you up. And you said, Lord, I believe and I receive. And somehow or another, you were transferred out of a domain of darkness and you became a whosoever. And he demands to be first place in love. He has first place in loving us. Did you know that God loves America? He loves America. We're a nation that's been blessed of God. Now, we don't always please God, but God loves every nation. Did you know that? Because God loves the world, for he so loved the world, the Bible says. But he loves us individually, making up the nations. And he calls us to walk in that love. He calls us to, to, to live in that, in that place, to, to rejoice before him. And Paul wrote to the Philippians and said, Therefore God has, all, has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ every knee will bow, whether in heaven or on earth, and every tongue will confess. What does that mean that every knee will bow? It means that you and I as whosoevers are going to bow before the Lord. But you know what else it means? It means that all those not whosoevers, every knee, people that have rejected him, people that said, you know, they don't want to believe, they don't want to trust, they don't want to submit, their knee's going to bow. And you know what it says? When our knees bow, every one of our tongues is going to confess. And what are we going to confess? I did it my way. That's not what we're going to confess. What we're going to confess is this, is that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He's risen from the dead. He is Lord. And we do it all to the glory of God. And thirdly, Christ is the fullness of the Godhead. The scripture says in verse 19 of our text, for in him all the fullness of God was placed to dwell. It's amplified this all this fullness in Colossians 2 9. For in him the whole of fullness of deity dwells bodily. The fullness of the deity of Christ was shown in the incarnation. The the word deity is a characteristic of of God's divinity. In deity, he is fully God. Christ fully possessed deity. He wasn't possessed of deity. He possessed deity. He is God. He was God. He'll always be God. God the Father, and Jesus is the center of the Trinity. Jesus the Son, and and God the Holy Spirit. He is fully divine, and, and he possesses that deity. And as the fullness of God, he is the Lord of all light so he's preeminent in creation jesus christ is preeminent spiritually as well the scripture tells us right here that in everything that he might be preeminent and the key words that sum up that that spiritual preeminence of christ are found in verses 20 and 22 making peace by the blood of his cross in his body of flesh by his death In his mighty sacrifice on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, what he does here is he demonstrates through his perfect humanity that his life and that his death were offered up as as an eternal spirit. To be eternally uh, powerful. In Hebrews 9, 14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, think about this, that, you know, he's, he's first place. He's preeminent spiritually. 
In Colossians 21 and 22, it says, You know, you were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh. And in this body of flesh, what it refers to is his life history. You know, what was his, his life history while he walked on earth? Well, what we, what we find there, when you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, you find that his walk was spiritual. He walked as a spiritual man. Anybody that's ever read anything in the New Testament would agree and would understand, well, certainly Jesus was a spiritual man. The Bible says in Hebrews 7, 26, for it was indeed uh, fitting that we should have such a high priest. He was holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. His walk was a spiritual walk. He could challenge anyone who would challenge his character. And as a matter of fact, he said, which one of you convicts me of sin? His words were spiritual. This is what people said about him. No one has ever spoken like this man. Another place it says they marveled at his gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And, and in Matthew 7, it says, When Jesus finished the sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. When the Lord Jesus Christ opened his mouth, there was something magnetic that was communicated, and it was different than the orthodoxy. It was different than the legalism. It was different than the ritualism. It was different than the intellectualism. It was different than the spiritualism. In John 6, 63, the Bible said, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. His, his works were spiritual. Those that witnessed his miracles, this is what they had to say. He has done all things well. And then, the spiritual preeminence of his death. We see it in his life. What about his death? In verse 20 and 23, it says, Making peace by the blood of his cross. 23, the hope of the gospel that you heard, proclaimed in all the creation and under heaven. The blood of the cross, it speaks of the spiritual preeminence of his death in history. You know, you, you cannot disprove Jesus as a historical figure. There was once a man by the name, he's still alive, Josh McDowell, who was not a believer. And he set out to disprove the historical Jesus. And as he set out to disprove the historical Jesus, he in turn became a believer because the evidence was so great for Jesus Christ and for his claims that he uh, would later pen a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And so when you look at the evidence of the Lord Jesus Christ, it demands a verdict in our lives. The blood of his cross. Consider, you know, the, the facts and the benefits of the cross. The fact and the benefit of the cross is, is that we have redemption and that we have forgiveness of our sin. The Bible tells us this in our text, verse 14, in whom we have redemption, the very forgiveness of sin. To have that, that sin debt paid for. To have a forgiveness of sin. You know, to, to get a do-over. You know, how often do we get do-overs? You know, you're speeding down the highway and you get pulled over by the cop. How often does he give you the do-over? I was thinking about this. I was watching this deal on National Geographic about a car called a, Buc a Buc Bucati, Bugatti, right? Can't even pronounce it. You know, these things are fabulous machines. As a matter of fact, as they're running it on the test track, 253 miles an hour. It goes through its 26 gallons of gasoline at that rate in 12 minutes. Can you imagine having something like that to cruise down the highway in? You know, on film, I mean, it, it flew by. It absolutely flew by. Now, you fly by... The cop at 253 miles an hour, <laughs> he's not going to come close to catching you till you run out of gas 11 minutes later, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, Joe. I mean, you know, 11 minutes, you're going to catch him anyway. But get this. Is he going to give you a warning ticket on that? 
you're probably going to jail. <laughs> you're not going to get a do-over. But in Christ, we get a do-over. I mean, we can be really major mess-ups. I mean, we might have been a, we might have been a um, shoplifter. Anybody ever been a shoplifter? I remember when I was a shoplifter. Man, I was a little boy. I was about six years old, and we were in Woolworths, and I was there with my mom and my sisters. And you know how boring it is as a six-year-old to have to go to the store with your mother and your sisters? And I went in the basement, and this is before they put all the matchbox cars and all these things that it takes a Sherman tank to blow the wrappings off of. They're just laying there in these things. Man, I filled my pockets up. I filled them up. I got home. You know, they're doing their thing. I'm in there on the hardwood floor. Man, I got my cars. And my sister sees that. Mother! You know how sisters are. Mother! She was paying me back for the time when I was three. And I walked out of her bedroom with a pack of Winstons <laughs> when my dad was starting the family devotional. And I remember being taken back to the Woolworth store in downtown Gainesville and having to go in with a little brown bag and present them back to the manager and get this spiel that I could go to jail. You know, we've all been guilty of something, haven't we? I wish that was all I'd ever been guilty of. But God says he gives me a do-over. A do-over through Christ Jesus. And, and in, verse, uh, in, in Psalm 103 Verse 12, he, he says that do-over, he removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. And, and, and then I get a God-made peace, according to verse number 20 of our text. And, and in that God-made peace, I get a reconciliation in verses 21 and 22. And you know what all this leads to? It leads to the grand finale of this morning's message. It leads to a personal preeminence of Jesus Christ. It leads to a decision. You know, last week I had so many of you say, oh, preacher, last week's worship service was so great. The preaching was so good. And man, I want to live up to that today. I want you to walk out of here and think that in my flesh. And the music, oh, it was awesome. Right? But it's only good and it's only awesome when it affects us and brings us to a place of decision whether we're a believer or whether we're not a believer. And, and if, if Christ is going to have preeminence in my life, it tells me in, in Colossians 1.27 that that's about Christ in me. Christ in me, the, the hope of glory. It means that I accept him. You know, Jesus Christ in theology is absolutely fundamental because if you don't have Christ in your theology, you've got a messed up theology. I mean, think about the Muslims. They've got a messed up theology, do they not? They worship Allah, right? And a lot of people say he's the same God as a Christian God. He is not the same God as a Christian God. And they've got a messed up theology because they've got the wrong view of Christ. They, they accept Christ. They accept him as a great prophet, but not as great as Muhammad. And, and, and here we've, we've got a, a, a religion that, that even teaches hate. You know, to, to say that it's a peaceful religion is hogwash. You know, I know that's what the political pundits want you to believe, but since when did you see Baptist and Methodist go and shoot and blow up each other because we, you know, lived under the title of Baptist and Methodist? I mean, they do that, Sunni and uh, Shiite, Right? Think about it. Let's go take out the Presbyterians after church. You know? I mean, isn't that nuts? And if you don't have Christ in your theology, I mean, you might be like the Hindus and you come up with all these multiplicity of gods. I remember when I was in um, Bali. You know, I was there among Hindus at this particular time, and I stepped on one of the offerings to their gods, and, and I was apologetic. And I said, that's okay. If, if he had wanted it, he would have taken it. But he didn't want it. You can have it. You know, get this. Jesus Christ, he didn't tell us to, 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 that, to make the sacrifice. He made the sacrifice. Christ is fundamental in theology, our, our belief system about God. And Jesus Christ in history, 
is evidential. You cannot deny that Jesus Christ was here. You cannot. Nobody can ever disprove that. Everybody agrees with that. But I want to share something with you, and it's of utmost importance. Jesus Christ in personal experience is consequential. In other words, if Jesus Christ has come to to be your Savior and has come to be your Lord, there's going to be some changes made in you. He's going to mess you up, as people say. Not in a derogatory kind of a way, but he's going to mess you up. He's going to shake you loose from all that junk that binds you. He's going to give you a freedom that you've never had before. He's going to pour out his love upon your life. He's going to lift you up and give you a hope, our hope and glory, Christ in us. He's going to give you a future. He's going to give you a purpose. He's going to give you a plan. He's going to give you heaven one day. And because of all those things, Christ in us is our hope of glory. And so we we can accept that. But we also have to acknowledge that. Paul put it this way to the Ephesians. He said that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. You know, there's a lot of people out there that accept the facts about Jesus Christ. Yeah, I believe he's a great man. I believe he's even God. I believe all that stuff. But I have not come to that place to acknowledge him in my life. Do you know you can have a head knowledge? You know, head knowledge is pretty cool, man. You can know a lot of stuff. You can also forget a lot of stuff. But what the Lord calls us to goes beyond what we know in our head. It becomes an experience of our hearts. And the longest distance in all the world, to me, is not the east to the west. But the longest distance to me is the distance between what I can know in my head and what I truly experience in my heart. Now, the Gnostics would say, that we opened up with, that he's writing to, well, it's all about the heart. It's about everything you feel. Well, you know, that's fine and dandy, right? But if your faith is built just upon what you feel, you don't have anything. Because some days I wake up and I feel cruddy. I'm not like one of our deacons that wakes up and looks at himself in the mirror and says, Good morning, Mr. Beautiful. Yeah, I know one of I won't tell you who it is. <laughs> I don't know why that came out. I guess God just inspired that moment. But, you know, some days you don't feel beautiful, do you? I mean, be honest. Really. So it can't just be based on what you feel. But, you know, it's not all about up here in the head either. It's not all intellect. You know, I don't want an intellectual faith. I want a faith that blends the two. I want to be able to read what God has said and God enlighten my mind to understand it and I want to have the feel from time to time. You understand what I'm saying? You know, you can't base your faith on feelings but a faith without feelings is not faith either. And so you come to that place to appreciate it. Christ in you, that hope of glory, he invades our lives and he indwells our lives by love and he infills our lives by hope. And through that process, this is what happens. He gives us a new certainty. The Bible tells us that we have uh, this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. You know, he gives me an optimism. This world may be falling apart. Shiites and Sunnis may be killing each other. They may join together to kill Christians. The church in Egypt is under dire attack today. And it's not just the Coptic church. Some of our Baptist churches where our missionaries have been at work for years have been burned down this week and and people are being killed. But I have a hope. And my hope is in Jesus Christ and nothing else. He is the very anchor of of our souls. So I've got a new certainty and I've also got, you know, a, a new radiancy. That in the midst of life, when all the struggles are there, Christ lives in me and that radiancy is to, is to shine through me and a new purity. The Bible says that everyone who has hope purifies himself. And that means that one day I want to be at a place where I stand before the Lord 
And I'm not going to be standing there as Dr. Steve, as pastor of Village Baptist Church. I'm going to be there just as old Stephen A. Davies as I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he's looking for in my life and is what he's looking for in your life is he's looking for a life that has been changed because of the hope that lives within. A life to be presented holy and pure and righteous before him because Christ has lived in us and lived through us, and flowed out of us. This morning, as we wrap up this worship service, our musicians, you'll see them move and come up, but our pastors are going to come up and assist me. We're going to take the Lord's Supper. And as we take the Lord's Supper, this is what we're going to do. We're all going to stand together, and you'll move out of your section of seats to your right. So that means, you know, if you're over here and Uh, This far section, they'll move their right. They'll come through and get their cup and their bread and go back into their section through the left. So, um, like right here, y'all will move to your right. You'll come by and go back into your left. Right here, you'll come out right and go back around. Everybody got that? So, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. Now, this morning, the Lord's Supper, the Bible tells us we're to do it in remembrance of Him. We're to remember what Christ has done. And we're to remember what Christ is doing, and we're to remember what he shall do. Okay? And we remember that great price that he paid for us, that great love he gave us, that great sacrifice that we too might have life. I'm going to pray, and as I pray, I'm going to ask our pastors to come on up, and then you stand and begin coming and receiving the elements, and hold on to those till everybody gets them. Heavenly Father, we... We, we come this morning and we lift Jesus Christ up. Lord, we declare that we're nothing, that he's everything. We declare, Lord, that we're, we're, we're at the bottom of the pole and he's preeminent, he's number one. And as we take of this table today, as we fellowship with you, we ask you to grow that fellowship greater and stronger and tighter. And we ask you to help us fellowship with one another as we take of the same bread and as we take of the same cup. And in all that we do, Lord, that we might point others through our lives to Christ Jesus, to who belongs the glory and the honor and the praise forever and ever. Oh, Lord Jesus, do come quickly. Do come and call your church home. For it's in Christ we pray. Amen.
Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed. He took bread and he broke it. And if you know anything about the life of the Middle East, bread is fundamental and foundational to life. And Jesus said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. He gave his life for us and he said, take this bread and eat it. Take and eat. And he took the cup and he blessed it. He said, this cup is my blood that's poured out for you. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, there's no removal of sin. He said, as often as you eat this bread and as often as you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Today we remember who Jesus was but who he is. We remember what he did for us on the cross, but we remember that the cross and the grave couldn't hold him, but he rose from the grave. And we remember this, that this same Jesus who went to the cross and went to the grave, he said, I am coming back. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Take and drink. And all God's people said, I'm glad you were here this morning. I pray the preeminence of Christ will rule and reign in your hearts and lives.